Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, if I speak too loudly or too quietly, please let me know. Uh, my name is Glenn Cates. I'm the uh, managing editor for digital at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Um, I think, but I think besides that, my qualification for hosting this panel is that I have two sisters who are teachers. Um, but, but seriously, everyone here, uh, we're really excited to have everyone here. Um, but as you're watching these experts speak, I want you to keep something in mind. Um, almost everyone you see here before you was educated, were, was educated in schools that were dominated by authoritarian regimes. Um, yet here they are before us as experts striving to liberalize society and make education more free in the countries that they come from. Uh, one of the questions that I think we should try to get at today is how, despite the envelopment of state propaganda, um, students currently going to school in authoritarian systems can develop into members of society with free, with, uh, free thought in the future. So um, I'm going to briefly introduce everyone. Um, you all have their bios, but I think it's important that um, you get to know these people because we really do have some really great people in front of us today. Um, first, uh, Mohammed Tooth Tahir. He's the, my colleague, actually, and the director of the Turkmen Service. Um, he, the Turkmen Service really provides information in what is one of the most difficult to reach environments in the world. And under Mohammed's leadership, the service has launched a number of programs, including um, bring representatives of foreign universities and scholars scholarships directly to Turkmenistan. Um, sitting to my left is Tamara Moskevich. Um, Tamara is the deputy chairperson of the Belarusian School Association and has been coordinator of the Teacher School Society program since 1999. Um, Ms. Matskevich has an all-encompassing education background, um, including in physics, I believe, so she's much smarter than me and probably anyone else in this room. Um, uh, she's she's editor-in-chief of Nastalni, Nastalnik uh, info, which is a website uh, for teachers, and she's she's really really active in the field of education in Belarus and, and making more free and open for members of society. Um, next, I have uh, Altai Gayusha, um, who is one of the leaders of Azerbaijan's Republican Alternative Movement, which promotes liberal democ democratic concepts and values. Until recently. Um, he was a professor of Turkic history at Baku State University. Um, you've also held numerous fellowships, including a Fulbright at Georgetown University and the Reagan Faskell Fellowship at the National Endowment for Democracy. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, Ivan Kriola is a professor of history at the University of a uh, European University at St. Petersburg. Uh, Kriola special, specializes specializes in history of U.S.-Russia relations and has a strong interest in the role of history, the role of history as a science plays in society. Um, I think particularly uh, given the state of the world right now, it's going to be really, really interesting to have you here, um, particularly given uh, your interest in U.S.-Russian uh, relations. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have each of the panelists speak for about five minutes, hopefully not more. I'm going to be really strict, I might cut some people off. Um, because I really, I think it's gonna be great to hear everyone speak, but what I want is to hear your questions and really get a dialogue going about um, not just education in authoritarian schools, but um, how can we make some of these things change and, and what sort of impact um, an authoritarian education has on the future of children in these societies. So uh, for introductions, I'll start from left to right, uh, or from your right to my left. I'll start with Mohammed. Thank you. I have two kids. And like all of us, they're uh, brilliant, information-interesting kids. Um, but they have one challenge. They do not speak Turkmen. 
we stick to it when me and my wife, we bought uh, water facade Turkmen, but it's yet to prove effective that we speak only in Turkmen at home, that they pick up our language. Although difficult, we are not giving up. So uh, two months ago, we requested a Turkmen language book uh, for beginners, like the ones you had, like A or A kind of books from Turkmenistan. So when my daughter opened the book, on the first page, she saw a portrait-sized picture uh, and came to me running to us whether this man was his grandfather, because she has not seen uh, uh, her grandfather. Um, but the picture in the book was none other than the president of Turkmenistan. Uh, so and then the same picture in a different shape in the second page, third page, and fourth page with the, each picture coming with the advice of the president how to be a good and loyal kid for the motherland. And then, for us it was easy to pack those books. For us it was easy to pack those books and put it somewhere with a sign that it's hard for the kids. But I'm thinking about 150,000 kids who every year enrolls to kindergartens in Turkmenistan because and the same number of kids enrolled for primary education. They start their academic career. Each of them has to read, has to memorize the same book day in after day. Now in schools, um, for years, students in Turkmenistan were expected to master in a, in a book uh, which is allegedly written by the former president of Turkmenistan called Ruhnama. And it is, content is confusing to say the least. It's a mixture of a Turkmen history which starts by the author himself and also has interpretation of the history uh, of Turkmenistan or Turkmen the way he sees fit into his ideology. Then uh, that, that book wasn't required only for the students of art in the schools and universities, but uh, students also read that book and uh, has to you know, pass test the ones who are in medical universities, the ones in the uh, law schools, and even the one who wants to take a, a driving test has to pass through uh, this book. And he also passed away, like the former president of Turkmenistan passed away in 2006, so, so his book uh, is no more relevant. Now, people in Turkmenistan even has a bigger challenge. Current president proved to be even faster in writing books than the previous president. So, in each uh, three or four months, he produces one book in average. So, each of those books has a specific topic which speaks to a specific portion of the society, and that specific portion of society has to own it, has to read it, has to memorize it, or it is required for their job or the for the future. But most most important book is a novel, which is uh, which which is about the president's own life and life of his father. Uh, although it is not yet part of the curriculum in schools or universities, but it is more important the ones which are in the curriculum already. So this is the, the way education is uh, you know, uh, used to promote the ideology. And there are more mechanisms through which uh, students are controlled. Uh, one of them is mass celebrations in the country, where students are forced to participate uh, in hundreds and thousands. In average, there is one mass celebration in Turkmenistan. In average, there is one, celebra one mass celebration in Turkmenistan. And that celebration could be about anything. That could be about the opening of a, a school, opening of a building, or it could be a horse racing, it could be car racing, in which uh, the gold medal goes obviously to the president himself. Um, it seems the event also just uh, an excuse and another method to make sure uh, that students remain under the state control because the entire crowd is expected to chant glory to the president from the start to the end of that event. A forward 
football player might throw a ball, the ball to the gate. But when people will chant, they will glorify the president, not the footballer. Which, so this is the way uh, it happened. But then also every student must wear state approved traditional clothing for girls. It's a long uh, dress, uh, head at the top. Then even the hairstyle has to be the way state approves. And for the boys, no exception. Boys, it's not allowed to grow beards, mustaches. Um, then you won't be allowed in Turkmenistan. Uh, and also, and also, they cannot even drive to school. That's how they are uh, restricted. Now, once students are graduated from schools, they have another challenge involving the state uh, control. Every year, over 100,000 uh, students are graduated from high schools. And there are only 8,000 places at universities. So you have a gap of 90,000 people there, a gap of 90,000 students. Now, demand's high and product is less. There is a tough competition. And uh, for you, most of you, it's not a surprise. There is an uh, NGO called Transparency International, which looks at the corruption index over the world. And that NGO puts Turkmenistan at the bottom of every year corruption list. So Turkmenistan is one of the most corrupt countries. So it's not, not a surprise for us to hear that uh, 50 to $60,000 are paid to bribe uh, a mechanism which would allow them uh, to get admission to higher education. And pay attention to, it, attention to this. In Turkmenistan, average monthly salary is no more than $300. And, and over 60% of the population is population of labor age and unemployed. And one might say students could go outside for studies, and thousands of them do go outside in Ukraine, Turkey, and Belarus being uh, the popular destinations uh, there. In, in fact, if there is an Ukrainian here, don't uh, get me wrong, we call your Kharkiv, province of Kharkiv, a fifth province of Turkmenistan. Because, uh, it, no, uh, it, 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 you know, not, no bad intention in mind, it's, we are not talking about something Crimea annexation here. It's only uh, because of the high number of the students, Turkmen students who are studying in, in Kharkiv. So, Mohammed, just um, if, maybe close out, and we'll we'll get back to that stuff. I, I'd love to talk to I could talk about Kharkiv all day, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about it after. But if you want to just just close up, and then we'll we'll go to the next. Sure, thing. sure. Um, so th that's that's one thing. Uh, th 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 finally, I would just want to give a personal note here. Um, looking into these challenges, uh, in 2013 we had a we had a project in in the Turkmen Center of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, which would uh, help Turkmen students to go, to go abroad and get uh, some decent education. As a part of the project, you mentioned uh, including that for two months we devoted ten minutes of air time in the Turkmen language uh, for the uh, our education project, in which we invited the representatives of the foreign universities, where they would explain the way with the way the Turkmen students in Turkmenistan could benefit from their programs, get admission. And then we also invited scholarship providing agencies abroad. They would educate Turkmen students how they can benefit from their funding. And then we also uh, uh, invited audience to, to send their questions to us that we then f uh, forwarded to the relevant people abroad. With this, we had unprecedented um, uh, number of feedback by the audience and probably have helped hundreds, maybe thousands of uh, students to get some education. So yes, Turkmenistan can be the best example uh, of how the authoritarian regimes use the education to promote their uh, ideology and ensure control over people, even at the cost of uh, putting the uh, the entire nation, the future of the entire nation in jeopardy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, do you know that here uh, we have in Belarus uh, translated in Belarusian language in our country? <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. And uh, I would like to detail the subject of our panel in two questions. 
is it possible to bring up a free person, a new democratic generation within non-democratic, illiberal educational system? And uh, how to protect the edu educational system from authoritarian regime? Is it possible at all? It is not secret that uh, existing authoritarian regimes use uh, educational system for their survival and strengthening. I would like to say how this process takes place in Belarus. Belarus is part of Europe geographically, historically and culturally. However, it was artificially removed from European processes. Belarus has received the Soviet educational system as a heritage. In the Soviet Union times, uh, education was a tool for propaganda, for preparing working staff for military industry. After the breakup of the communist bloc, Belarus had only three years for post-communist educational reform according to European approaches. After, uh, however, in 1994, Lukashenko came into power. It was the first and the last our elections in new history of Belarus. Uh, innovation were revoked. Uh, the state monopoly over the school was consolidated. Now their authorities regard, teach, regard teachers as uh, an instrument for bolstering the existing regime. They strictly limit teachers' freedom using labor contracts, bureaucracy, strong uh, control and so on. A big part of local electoral commission members who falsify elections is teachers. Obedient teachers get privileges and promotion. At the same time, not only teachers, but also students have been uh, repressed for their democratic views and activities. Nothing new. A dictatorship is a, a dictatorship. But uh, there is one difference, uh, one characteristic feature in Belarus under Lukashenko. Uh, the authorities try to remove all, all national identification factors from educational system, national language, national values, and national history. All this replaced by um, uh, pro-Russian identification, uh, um, new Soviet, uh, homo-sovieticus identification, so-called. Um, including Russian language. The authorities are afraid that Belarusians would identify themselves as a European nation with deep democratic roots, with natural democratic choice, with a natural democratic uh, future. To bring uh, Belarus back into European cultural environment, uh, the educational system should aim uh, at building modern Belarusian nation. Uh, the stagnation in official education is evident. The level uh, of education gets lower and lower. At the same time, education is an uh, absolute value for Belarusian people. Such a contradiction uh, pushes responsible teachers, parents and students to create alternative independent value-based educational uh, communities. It, uh, this means Belarus is on its way of building of civil society in the field of education. Nevertheless, non-formal education cannot replace the formal one. Uh, the authorities must imitate changes toward uh, world innovations. Uh, this creates a niche, a space for democratically thinking educators to implement their uh, ideas. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a risk of distortion of good ideas in non-free educational system. The majority of teachers want to be professionals. They are ready for changes. It is important to find and to support such teachers. There is about 2,000 teachers in our network. We discuss a lot how to rise uh, a free person in Belarusian school. Let me give two examples of concrete uh, direction on our work. The, one of our programs deals with new strategy uh, in education, new philosophy in education, the formative assessment. Formative assessment is recognized worldwide as the most effective tool to improve students' uh, achievements and to develop their civil and uh, uh, social competences. 
After several years of uh, suspicions and even persecution of the participants, now uh, there are innovative platforms uh, on this methodology functioning in 10 schools. The second example is uh, the program of media literacy. A Russian aggression against Ukraine uh, has shown that Belarusian people have fallen under strong influence of Russian media, Russian propaganda. In this regard, the critical thinking and media literacy are key competences, uh, competences for protection of democracy and survival as a nation, as an independent state. Uh, in addition, media education makes uh, the uh, content uh, of education more open to the world, uh, more actual. It is uh, critically important for non-free countries. Uh, media education has become a popular uh, topic among teachers. They try to integrate media education to all school subjects. And returning to my uh, starting point, let me state, the, in the 21st century, even the most sophisticated authoritarianism is not in position to keep total control over the sphere of education. I believe in education. I, I, I'm sure that only educated people has the chance to build a system based on the rule of law, uh, human rights and uh, free expression. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for having me here. It's a really great honor. Thank you for coming. Uh, let me start with one um, uh, quote from the rector of the university where I uh, worked until recently. He appeared in you know, public and said that, you know, if all these journalists who are now criticizing our government, if they were the graduates of our university, they would never criticize the government. So that was his point about the journalism. He went out and not publicly said. Uh, let me just, as a historian, take you a little bit back to the history, because I think it's very important for, our, for understanding the situation in Azerbaijan. Uh, you know, uh, we lived under the Soviet rule for 70 years. We were cut from the outside world. We didn't know what's going on there. And information which was coming from the state media was contradictory. In one hand, they were saying that the Western capitalism is uh, going towards its demise. It's going to collapse. Everything is very bad there. Unemployment is raising and all of this kind of things. On the other hand, they were saying that we're going to, have to catch up them. We are going to catch up them in technology and all of these things. So uh, it meant that, you know, for us it was a little bit strange. We are going to catch up the, the world, which is going to die. So, so this, is, was, this was a little bit strange. So we were, the cut, we were cut from the rest of the world and we didn't know what's going on there. And suddenly the Soviet Union collapsed and Interestingly, we found themselves in 1918-1920. Why I'm saying that? Because, you know, it was a time when the first Azerbaijan Republic was created. And it got its independence. Uh, it was a more or less democratic country with parliamentary democracy and uh, with uh, secular law, which replaced the Sharia, actually, courts. Uh, but it's very different, uh, interesting time from uh, many perspectives. Uh, but at the same time, it was a kind of you know nationalistic state. It was a normal for 1980 because uh, it was a kind of result of the nation-building process when the uh, ethnic nationalism, to some uh, you know some extent, played a very significant role and positive role, let me say, because it divorced the Urban from. Uh, it's old, you know, let me say, old religious identity when it brought the secularism, all of those things. But the problem is, from 19 to the Second World War, this nationalism, uh, you know, lived through its rise and fall. We saw what happened. It brought lots of things. I mean, it brought uh, uh, kind of calamities to the European world. And what's actually going on uh, what was going on in the 
democracy, it was in the theory of democracy after the Second World War. It's completely different what was before the, uh, before the uh, uh, World War. Because after the Second World War, democracy now is more about civil rights. It's more about minority rights. It's more about civil society, which, it, which has already replaced you know, all nation state, nationalism, saying. But the problem is, in Azerbaijan, we didn't see that. And we went back to 1918. And imagine now, when this nationalism, not in the hands of the democratic state, which I believe that it, if this republic continued, we would have a kind of free expression, we would have lots of discussion, and uh, later, uh, 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 not later, maybe, maybe uh, I think uh, it, could, it could happen even earlier than later that eventually we could come to the same point as the European, Western European countries. But imagine now the situation when, uh, when this nationalism is actually in the hands of the regime which cares only about its longevity, how to extend its life, how to make itself, you know, kind of forever. And that's why this, in this time, after the Second World War in the uh, 2000, nationalism is employed by the regime to, to fight all of the things which can pose a threat to the longevity of the state. And what are these things? These are, first of all, freedom. Freedom is a tool in the hands of the Western capitalism to impose its, let me say, interest on us. It's a diversity. What does it mean, diversity? Diversity is the right of those which our identity do not accept. So all of the things which are actually uh, good things, which can bring, which you know, Western uh, countries live through, they are portrayed as a threat, as an enemy of the state. So nationalism is a uh, is a kind of thing which can uh, which can pose threat to the nation nation state of Azerbaijan. And what's interesting, actually, I heard lots of let's say discussions on this point in many Western universities, and I heard some very respected scholars who were trying to prove that. This is a normal thing. This is a part of nation building. You know, first of all, you must have a very strong state, and when after you have a strong state, maybe you can talk now about rule of law, about the uh, uh, representative government. But if you don't have, uh, if you don't have this, you know, strong state, when all of these things, rule of law, they will not play any significant role. That they, we don't, you will not need that. So my point is, this is completely. Diff uh, completely wrong story, wrong, wrong understand. Imagine what happened uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. We went back to the 1980, right? But what it would, will happen with the population which are hostile towards freedom, which are hostile towards diversity, which are toward, uh, hostile to civil society? What will happen to this, uh, let me say, to this society in the best case scenario? This people will be back to the 1980. But this is the best case scenario. But I believe it's, it's not going to happen. And most important thing, it should be said always that what's going on, now, for example, in the Arab countries now, it's not the, uh, the reason, the, the main reason for that, that they live 40 years, 50 years, 30 years under the regime which made the population hostile towards everything good. So this is the result of this 40 years regime, 30 years regime, what they live through. So in order to, you know, to achieve real, let me say, development, in order to achieve kind of, let me say, prosperity, it's imperative that education must provide all the needed things. And I'm coming to the most important part. What can provide us? What, how, uh, how can we provide these things? Of course, it's through the education. But as I said, these regimes, they do not tolerate. They do not tolerate academic freedom. Because they think that ac academic freedom is a thing which can destroy their ideology. 
I can say about my own exam that you know you have all the state propaganda always in the fact faculty is the most important faculty for the nation building through the, throughout the history. Uh, in some uh, stages of history, it really played a very positive role. It's not the same now. But when, for example, I'm just one teacher, I'm coming out, I'm saying about the saints, which may be saying that freedom is not bad saying. I mean, uh, saying very simple things, you know, very naive things, which is, which is you know, commonly accepted truth. And they even cannot tolerate this one. And they cannot tolerate this one, and they uh, actually uh, expel me from the university. But what's the most important thing in my view? Did I succeed? Was it successful? And I can say I was alone. Not alone, of course, there are many guys. But was, I was expelled from the university. It showed that their propaganda, state propaganda, their propaganda was, you know, a diary of schools in the university, they actually worthless. Because when I was expelled from the university, students went out. They had to be under the, you know, let me say, under the, uh, let me say, impression of this propaganda. But they, they didn't like me. I can't say that all of them liked me. I had lots of, you know, kind of uh, problems with the students, but they went to the street to protect academic freedom. And I think that's why I'm saying that uh, education, maybe they can cut our ways, but still we can find the ways to, you know, to deliver our, to deliver simple truths to the, uh, to the uh, youth, and I think it's going to play uh, it's very significant role. So good, thanks for saying that. I, mean, I think that's one of the things we're definitely going to have to talk about today is, is, is why that happens despite everything else. So, Ivan, thank you very much. Thanks for waiting. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm also a historian, so I will follow the example of uh, Altai and also start with, this, with the history. And uh, I will say that, okay, I grew up in the Soviet Union and I graduated from the university actually in 1991, just several months before the University of the Soviet Union. Collapsing. And I remember that type of education. Uh, and uh, what I will say that uh, the autocratic regimes are different. Uh, they, well, you, you have a lot of, if, you're political, if you are a political scientist, you know that you, can, you, you have a lot of uh, criteria to distinguish one type of autocratic uh, regime from another. And one of the possible criteria is how they uh, see the future and how they uh, put, the, uh, put the priorities in their work. And autocratic regimes uh, may be regimes of a developed developing regimes. And the Soviet Union, to some extent, with all of its totalitarian ideology, was a uh, regime which uh, had in mind the uh, development. It, looks, it was oriented to the future. And it was, OK, it was, it was a communist future. It was a future which uh, not many of us maybe liked. But, but it, it, it was oriented to the future. And it uh, invested into education. And especially, of course, in the technical education, because of the Cold War, because of the need of uh, arms race, because they needed uh, the most sophisticated weaponry. But uh, because of that, uh, education, again, especially engineering and uh, science education, was uh, among the priorities of the Soviet Union. Well, uh, for the humanities, it was much worse uh, period. But uh, as a general, the straight of educators, uh, the social part, uh, the part of the society which uh, was in, uh, engaged in the education was a relatively well 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 being uh, part of, of Soviet society. Uh, then in the 1990s we had a, a brief well like one decade a period of, of uh, freedom. Uh, well, we had a lot of problems at that time, economic problems and a lot of. Uh, social problems, but at the same time for educators it was a time of freedom. It was a time when it, we, we were very low paid, but uh, we had the uh, freedom to teach whatever we, we thought it was important. We, uh, that was a time when many of uh, so Russian already scholars traveled first, for the first time traveled abroad, uh, participated in academic exchanges, start, started to read uh, world literature on their subjects. So it was uh, the whole decade, or maybe more, maybe when the first years of the new millennium, it was still uh, in place. And uh, that was a time when uh, even humanities and uh, social sciences uh, developed uh, very, very well in, in, in Russia. But after that, we had after that. After that, uh, after that uh, the new uh, authoritarian regime began to consolidate, and the new authoritarian regime di uh, differed from the Soviet 
type, uh, okay, the different in many, many instances, but one of the most important from, from this point of view, from today's uh, top point of view, uh, that the current regime uh, was not a regime of, uh, of a developing. Uh, you know, the, if you look at the, uh, at the situation in, in, in Russia, uh, you will see that nobody speaks about the future. The future is just absent. Uh, they speak a lot, uh, Putin personally and many people speak a lot about the past, about history. As a historian, I know how, how much uh, it, it is said about history, how many myths are promoted about the history, but nobody wants to speak about the future a little bit more. And education is something about the future. So education uh, just uh, loses its position as one of the priorities of the development. And education in today's Russia is something which is, well, uh, the last time Putin tried to produce some uh, comprehensive picture of his priorities. It was before the elections of 2012. He published a series of articles uh, about his vision of the society. Uh, he put the education at the same line just as the comma with a, a pension system for retirement. So it's something, you know, this is a burden for the state. We, we need to pay for, for education, but it's something like, you know, like pensions. And this is not about uh, priority, not about development. Education does not look from the current regime does, does not see uh, the source of the development and the education. Well, probably, of course, they, they get a lot of, most of its revenue until recently from the oil prices and from, you know, from export of the uh, oil and gas, but uh, also education was uh, just a burden. And uh, we, uh, naturally, we saw a huge cuts in the education system, especially you know, during the last decade, and uh, we, we had, uh, well, I don't just know the figures uh, by today, but uh, there was a published uh, government plan to have uh, by 2018 40% of uh, higher education in, in Russia cut. So for almost every second uh, professor will, will lose a job. Uh, and uh, so it's, uh, to, uh, and that's, that plan was made with a much higher uh, oil prices. So I think that today is even worse because of the budget cuts are more severe in today's Russia. And that's uh, created the situation when the education is not just a, not a priority, but it also produced and um, made uh, people, uh, well, professors and school teachers, uh, very vulnerable because everybody knows that uh, this, uh, these huge uh, job cuts are going on. And everybody is vulnerable, everybody can be, uh, hired, uh, can be fired. Uh, and of course, uh, there is no, well, no, no good criteria who will be fired and who will uh, remain at the job, uh, his, his or her job. And uh, this may uh, make people in the education very dependent from the uh, supervisors and from the authorities, especially in the secondary and elementary education, because those people are much less, uh, much less secure from, from this uh, pressure from, from the local authorities. People in the higher education in the universities are much more active, first of all, have more uh, uh, networking and uh, of course uh, they uh, very much remember the 1990s and uh, maybe unlike uh, in Turkmenistan case or you know I uh, so or maybe even Azerbaijan it looks like uh, remembers of the future and our tomorrow but it's not yet today because just because we have a pretty large resistance and this is a still a pretty big uh, part of the society and uh, we saw during those um, <coughs> protests after the elections of 2011-2012, we saw a lot of uh, people from the education, people from the universities participating in the street protest against that. We had several uh, networks uh, like Volny Staicheske Obchestva, Free Historical Society, which tries to prevent uh, the, uh, the more, very, very famous uh, historians participating in that uh, society. And we are trying to prevent the historic uh, use of history by the state, by the regime. Uh, we had uh, uh, some, well, small but very active uh, trade unions uh, which tried to, 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 re to resist or to, to defend the rights of the educators. Well, uh, of course, I, I, I should confess that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the regime, re regime stress, uh, it's uh, still, uh, we, don't, we don't strong enough. But uh, on the other hand, we have a reputation, we have some accesses to, to, to media, well, especially, of course, electronic media, especially uh, social media and uh, social networks and, uh, and, and uh, several important newspapers. And, uh, 
And uh, so what we see now, we see that uh, current regime in Russia looks like um, it looks like the regime just abandoned it, uh, not just in education, but the whole street of educated people. Uh, before 2011, I would say that President Putin tried to to play a role of the president of all Russians, Russians without that. After 2012, he does not pretend to be a president of all Russians. He just uh, do not uh, speak anything uh, to, to the educated people. So he, let's, let's go. Yeah, I'm, I'm finishing. Yeah, I'm finishing. So we, what we have now uh, in Russia is a situation of the, well, some, somebody called it the uh, cold civil war. And on the other hand, of that cold civil war, most educated class of, of Russia. And this is a situation which which is continued to, to be, and uh, I don't know what is the final. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I think, what, I think actually what you, you saw from all these speakers is that um, although everyone is working in authoritarian regimes, the education system, every authoritarian regime sort of has its own strategy for dealing with education. Um, but I want to start this question, uh, I want to start with a question from the perspective of an authoritarian leader, because uh, I don't think Forum 2000 invited any authoritarian leaders to this conference, so I'm going to, I'm going to play one right now. Um, and I think if an authoritarian leader was sitting up here, first of all, he would say, I don't want to have this debate, we don't need to do this. But if you're, for some reason he agreed to participate in the debate, he would say, um, well, you know, you guys have your, your liberal educational norms, but, but here in my country, could I be, I'm going to be Luka for a second. Um, here in my country, we establish a national narrative that you guys don't have. Um, we all read the same books. Um, when we go camping, we sing the same songs. Uh, if, if I meet someone on the street in, in one place in a faraway village, we'll have the same basic um, knowledge that someone in uh, Minsk, Minsk might have. Uh, how, would you, how would you respond to that? And I'll start with you tomorrow. In, in, in free education? Uh, no. Same, the same situation? Uh, you know, in, a, in a first... Every country you have, you have the same situation about the content of education? No. The it, same in all languages? The, the opposite, actually. So, so in, in an authoritarian regime, right? If you have... Um, if you have... Everything's sort of laid out for you, right? Um, you know, you, you learn about Lukashenko, you learn about uh, your shared, shared history. Uh, whereas in a liberal regime, right? Um, you might have, school, one school might teach you one thing, another might have, teach you another thing. Uh, there might not be the same national standards, right? For, uh, for patriotic education. And isn't that an important part of a child's uh, upbringing, the patriotic education? And where is the line between this sort of national education and a patriotic education? Because it's something that Putin also tries to do in the you know, this national narrative, especially history uh, narrative, the unified history textbook. And for, for to, to, to produce to up, uh, make this patriotic education, it's something about his uh, speeches and his program, maybe. And uh, well, what, what I would uh, answer that uh, the source of the development in the contemporary world is uh, is a multi uh, multiple uh, multiple uh, points of view. It's a different differentiation. With, uh, it's a different point of view existing in, within within the society. So if everybody will uh, have their own. Uh, uh, only one point of view. And there is no uh, so, uh, no source for for development of the society on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, you will know um, uh, if a person will uh, see somebody who has a different point of view. He has now no uh, way to well. It, it will be hard to, to, to argue, it will be hard to defend his own position because if he, uh, if everybody grew up in the same uh, ideas, you know, within the same ideas, without even the hint that there are different points of view in the, in, in the world, uh, it's, uh, well, it's, it's not only unhealthy, but it's bad for the, for, for, for the state himself itself because, well, how you will, uh, how you will argue, how you will defend your own position if you don't knew uh, your your uh, years of education, you knew you didn't knew that the different position even existed. Well, but for instance, should there be a unified historical narrative? For instance, <coughs> in one day you have one leader, yeah. 
and you have you have these books that you read. The next day you have a new leader, and you have a new, whole new set of books. Does that old history get thrown out, or is that something that that is taken with you as you as you age? Are you um, you, how can you forget what you've already learned? Very easy. Because there is all mechanisms available and forced by the state to, to make this transition smooth. That is to say, um, do you have one, one vision day and night imposed on you through the state media? There is no uh, alternative point of view um, to present what was the advantage or disadvantage of the previous the system compared to the system which is available in trying to enforce its own vision uh, and trying to push out the other one. So just only one vision is available. It, and people who, who, who knows a little bit about the, the existence of critical thinking, existence of questioning something which imposed on you just does not exist. And people who have the skills they are pushed out from the from the uh, from the, uh, is it, the, the the circle uh, who are which are able to raise their voices. For example, with my Harvard diploma, for instance, if I go to Turkmenistan, it doesn't mean anything. And so, if if it does not mean anything, so I don't mean anything. I would be a farm, farmer again planting my uh, grain, for example. Who would listen to me? Okay, I will. You know, if, if that authoritarian leader presence here, my response from the same historical point of view would be, so you are inventing history, it's good. You are teaching your people a new history, kind of patriotic history of the state. But in order to teach the history, you have to learn history as well. Okay, you are not teaching the right history to your, people, to your people in order to consolidate your power or your state, but you know the history itself, that your regime will not survive and will not live forever. It will collapse later or sooner, sooner than later. So what will happen to the people who live under the, your society, who after collapse of the regime, will look at everybody around as enemy. So he's now, he or she is now surrounded by the enemy. What we, I'll tell you one story. You know, I, I put, you know, we are now very active on social media. I put just one, you know, from our Azerbaijani history. I put an example. So about one of the shafts. I didn't say, I didn't comment. I just put the fact that this shaft killed his first son. Then he blinded his second son. And then he imprisoned his third son. I didn't comment anything. I just put the, uh, this, uh, this, you know, fact. And I was attacked by those guys. Why are you saying that? I said, I'm not saying anything. I just put the fact. Why are you saying? What's your intention? I, thought, I don't have an intention. It's just fact from the history. You know, I, uh, what, what are you doing? What, why, why are you blaming our shots? You know, I'm, not, I, I'm not blaming anybody. I just put <laughs> what we did in the history. You know. I didn't comment any word, just show me any word. So I mean that, you know, uh, there are many things which we can say to those leaders. And of course they are not, let me say, uh, the problem, as I said, uh, they are afraid of competitiveness. That's why they are silencing us. And so the reason why they are silenc silencing us, that, that they do not answer, to, uh, they, do not, they do not have answer to our questions. In this, in this case, I agree with Ivan. Uh, they say that uh, the um, uh, authoritarian regime in uh, Russia and Belarus, uh, the same, is not development regime for development. They uh, are not uh, thinking for future uh, because uh, they they blame. Okay, blaming people is is good for th this regime, not for only for for preserving. Uh, for preserving power, not for for development. Because of this, uh, they uh, 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 they um, try to control all uh, all to low, to low, uh, educational level, to control uh, content of education, to to um, 
mean, to have a, a dual ideology as a tool for, for blaming, for, for uh, destruction of for new generation, for tainting a new, new generation. Uh, but uh, in our case, Belarusian uh, society is not too closed. Uh, we, uh, no, I don't know how in uh, Turkmenistan, but we have free internet. And uh, Belarusian people uh, try to find uh, alternative information. They uh, make. Um, uh, I need to. Uh, they pretend they agree. Uh, they pretend they agree with the ideology, but um, but want. Um, and the, it's the first. They want to. To leave the country. From this. Uh, from this situation, and it's not good for perspective. No. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's exactly, that's exactly what I wanted. And, and in fact, uh, I'm going to ask uh, one more question and then I want you all to ask questions as well. Um, I, I said this at the beginning, but we're all talking about education in authoritarian regimes, but we also all have dreams uh, for the countries that we're coming from, right? You have dreams that one day society will be more liberal, mm -hmm. more democratic. What sort of effect does the education that people in your countries are currently undergoing, what would that, what, how do you overcome that effect in a more liberal future? Or, or is it possible to overcome? And I'll tell you, I think you started discussing this a little bit. You, you discussed what's happening in Syria right now. I mean, are you, are you, are you saying that something like that is possible in, in, in one of these countries? Or? It depends on the longevity of the regime. If it, if it continues for 40 years, yeah, of course it's possible. There are all the, let me say, uh, circumstances there which can make this possible. But at the same time, we are relying on, let me say, on a uh, kind of tradition which we had before, and that's, we, we expect that it will never happen. But as I said, you know, maybe in Turkmenistan they deal in a, different, a difficult situation, they do not um, have internet. But uh, yeah, we have a Facebook, internet, and I, I'm just telling you the, 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 uh, the histo uh, real history, that we are actually winning the games. They experiment from auditorium. Ima imagine one auditorium I had maybe 100 students like, uh, right? Now, when just 100 people likes my Facebook page. I, I see it's a failure, you know, because I know that uh, more people are reading, more are people, and I'm putting some kind of, let me say, surveys to, you know, the, the, the narrative of the uh, official uh, narrative of the uh, uh, government and my vision of the same story. And always we are winning. We are on the winning side. And I think uh, that education, um, Okay, they close our, let me say, our access to the universities, but still we have lots of ways of dealing with this issue. And I think uh, in our, in Azerbaijan case, I can't, uh, you have to go uh, of, of this particular case. In Azerbaijan case, uh, we are winning. Why they did this, you know, crackdown in 2014? It was a coup. Because we were winning, you know, they saw that we are we are winning. They are losing. That's why they did it. And what happened? What's happening now? I see after all of this crackdown, which still continues, they're failing to silence us. They're failing to silence people. They still find a way to express their views, to educate people on the very basic values, on a very basic value. Uh, well, I think you might have something to say about this too, because um, you know, Soviet Union falls, things change, right? Um, and, and how, do, do you think that Russia is still sort of, um, in a way, recovering from 70 years under the Soviet Union? Does it have a lot to do with the actual education, the education system that was in place? On the one hand, yes. On the one hand, of course, uh, the, uh, the distortions of the 70 years of communist rule has uh, had some uh, long lasted effects on the education and uh, we still have uh, problems with especially with social sciences we, have, we still have uh, a lot of people who call themselves like political scientists being uh, just a continuation of the scientific communism you know and uh, who, who never uh, use the uh, take, uh, use the methodology of, of world political 
political science or something like that. And these uh, internal uh, problems, we, we had the problem which also strictly connected with the wider social problems like uh, you know fake dissertations uh, and uh, many uh, academic councils that award uh, academic degrees uh, for people who do not. Uh, did not write the dissertations, and, and many people knew about that. So it's, it's a lot of uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, things which we can trace back to the Soviet Soviet time. On the other hand, uh, still, uh, as I as I told in the very beginning, Soviet uh, Soviet Union did created the mass education, it created the mass and uh, wide uh, education, including the higher education university. Uh, some of them were world uh, on the world best uh, among the world best and that's also the uh, legacy of, of the Soviet Union and this is yet so we cannot say that everything was uh, you know, bad in this I do not want to defend the Soviet Union but I just want to say that in some aspects current regime working even to de uh, demodernize the society which was modernized uh, well distorted yet modernized but modernized by the Soviet power and this is a so uh, what we will have uh, what kind of Future. Just a question, do you think that's a strategic move or is it just different priorities? I don't see any strategy in the current regime. So it's, uh, I, I cannot say anything strategic, actually strategic more than for one year or to make the next election. So I don't think it's strategic, it's just that means the, uh, not insufficient understanding of what is really uh, should be done in, in the country. Um, I, I think we should open it up to questions from from you all. Um, who'd like to ask a question? Hello, my name is Mikhail, I'm a debate coach here in Prague, and I have a question regarding like nationalism and cynicism, because I know, I mean, I'm not so informed about the other countries, but I know in Russia that there are, for example, many Russian students studying like here in Prague or someplace else in the West, but still because of things like nationalism, they would be sort of like very skeptical. They would, you know, when you would discuss with them issues like the Crimea annexation, they would be like, yes, you know, Russia today isn't exactly reliable, but the Western media are manipulated as well, and so on. They would basically claim that you know, the economist is on the same level with Russia today. And uh, that sounds, to me, sounds a bit crazy, right? But how do you, I mean, how do you make sure that just getting the information will do the trick in terms of liberalization and, you know, freedom and so on? Thank you. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, I'm not sure at all that uh, more, more information will make the trick. It's, uh, you know, more infor we have uh, access to information, and Russians uh, have access to information through the internet, through the, you know, you can read and uh, so it's not not to say. Um, well, of course, there are a big portion of the population, especially elderly, especially in the outside of the big cities, who are rely relied mostly on the TV. But many younger people and the students, you see. Are do have, have the access to, to, to information, so it's a different, uh, a, a different problem. It's not 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 a problem of the access to information. But on the other hand, I would say that uh, well, uh, one of the yeah, you you mentioned that the first, the first in the first, first phrase cynicism, and you know something that the regime is uh, translating is cynicism, and you know from the very beginning, it's, uh, the, the, one of the major. Uh, uh, message that the regime uh, sends to Russian society is uh, every, everybody lies, you know, like Dr. House. Uh, and uh, everybody lies. And there is no truth. Everything is uh, relative. There is no uh, real uh, information, just propaganda of, of one side. And this is a, uh, one of the very uh, spoiling uh, influence of the current regime, one of the things why I didn't like it. So I don't have the question what to do, but I hope that <laughs> we'll find it. My name is Arzu Biyabula, I'm from Azerbaijan. Uh, perhaps it's, it's less of a question, but more of a comment. Uh, because I'm a child of Soviet Union, I did go to school during the Soviet Union, and I did go through the transition of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And it really had a huge impact on our school, because it was, a, it was one of the Russian teaching schools, so that had an impact on the way language shifted and how classes shifted as well. Uh, but to me personally, um, I saw the transition of teachers, like all the good teachers in schools left. And then we had these teachers who would come in and teach, for example, geography to a Russian speaking class in Azerbaijani. And then, you know, my parents would go crazy. It's like, what is this? Like, how does that have an impact? But then, you know, we were lucky because there were other options of, of, of schooling in, in Azerbaijan, and so I switched to a different school. But my point being is, 
in many ways I've been lucky because I also had a chance to study abroad and get a different kind of education. Whereas in Azerbaijan, the, the moment things started to go downwards in terms of education and you know the corruption entered the schools and universities and that had an impact on quality of education, teachers started changing. Um, the alternatives that were being created outside of traditional education establishments, like a very great example that I really like talking about is the Free Thought University that our friends created. Um, and they would serve as a platform for university students to actually come and listen to lectures like Al um, to basically get access to the things that they didn't really have in traditional universities and traditional schools. But then seeing this, the government got really scared, and so they shut down that initiative as well. Um, and so I guess that will bring me to the question in, in that, you know, even when you do try to create alternatives to education in authoritarian states, you know, you always get this a, a block. At some point you get you get you know, blocked from doing something. So how do you challenge that in an authoritarian state? Or do, can you? Like what's the what's the next step? So I think that's I think that's an important question. And I, I think actually that's something that that one of the things we want to get at here. And I think Tamara, this is something that you do. Um, you work in the confines of uh, the Belarusian state, but you try to find ways to get people a normal education. So why don't you just talk about that for a little bit? I have talked about uh, the creation of alternative uh, platform of ed education uh, um, um, in the sphere of informal or uh, non-formal education. Uh, we have a lot of such uh, courses, uh, e-learning courses, uh, and uh, uh, new form, for example, talk shows, <laughs> talk show and other. But uh, as I pointed, uh, informal education, non-formal cannot, uh, cannot uh, fulfill all these uh, gaps of, of education. We need to do something with formal education. And uh, in, in our case, we try to create uh, their islands of democracy within the, uh, of, uh, the, the system of education, official system of education. Uh, we uh, try to unite teachers, um, for example, on, uh, like on the platform of uh, uh, e-learning, but it is uh, not a typical e-learning uh, e course, uh, courses, is, it is E, e, um, not e-learning, electronic support of teachers, uh, support of independent activities of teachers in sphere of democracy, in sphere of civil education, in, civil, uh, in sphere of media education, for example. Teachers have uh, provided the, um, uh, for example, uh, one or two pages of uh, theoretical information and they have a task to do something in their, uh, in the, in their classes. And uh, we have a uh, demo democratically minded, minded um, group of teachers, a group of specialists on the all level of uh, official educational system. And uh, returning to the previous questions, I think that when we have, when we will have mechanism to change situation, when situation is uh, was changed, uh, we are almost re <laughs> ready for changes because we have such crystals in uh, in all 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 spheres of uh, in all on all levels of formal education uh, uh, Mohammed, i think you could also maybe speak to this too because you know i, I think if we're going to talk about authoritarian regime regimes Turkmenistan is is its own case and um you but you've had programs where you, we discuss this, where you've, where you've tried to bring scholars uh, to Turkmenistan. How, in a regime like the regime that exists in Turkmenistan, how do you sort of bend the rules a little bit to, to give people some semblance of the education that, that, um, that you think they, they might need? You know, in, in, within the territory of Turkmenistan, it seems at this moment a little bit impossible. People are system is so tough, so strict, and 
and people see no way out from that. And when you ask the same question to a person who is in Turkmenistan, the answer would be, the answer would be probably like this. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of proverb, with joke actually, very much used in Turkmenistan. Like, um, there were three uh, people, one from Kazakhstan, one from Uzbekistan, the one from uh, Turkmenistan, they were sitting in a, uh, they were intending to go to speak to God when the situation is going to change, for example, the education system. So first, Kazakh goes to God, God is presumably sitting somewhere in the room, Kazakh says when it's going to change, and God says, like, maybe five years, wait for five years. Kazakh was sad anyway, but he left the room, then Uzbek comes, and he, he asks the same question. God says, ten years, Uzbek, then he's, he's kind of, yeah, more sad than Kazakh, then goes Turkmen then. And then when Turkmen asks the same question, actually God starts crying. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know. I don't know when, when things, two things will change. But the, this is the situation in Turkmenistan. Uh, it's just the hopelessness is everywhere, darkness is everywhere. But the, our project and the people that we speak in Turkmenistan, it gives one signal. Like the exposure of Turkmen students to outside universities is changing society in itself. Yes, in Turkmenistan there is only 8,000 places for out of 100,000 students that are graduated every year. So this pressure, this method of pressure is in itself changing society because people have to go outside to get education from somewhere. Like every year, even if they are in Ukraine, even if they are in Belarus, they are learning something every day, which would not be possible in Turkmenistan. So they go back with new ideas, with, with knowledge of internet, and we see it from all our example. Is it, it is changing day after day. I, I remember like four years ago when I came to this position as director of Turkmen Service. Since then, the visitors to our website has changed like maybe 30,000 person. And they are all coming from Turkmenistan. If they find ways, despite our website's block, if they find ways to get into our website, it means they are trusty, they are changing. They are learning something from our website. It is changing. It will take time, but people themselves are finding ways to get out of the situation. Authorities are not doing it. They are, what they are doing is just to keep them in darkness. Yeah. You know, with Free South University, I had a very interesting case. You know, I, I was entering my class. I had a class actually at Baku State University, my official class, previous one. Now I was leaving the class, two students approached me and said, we have a question, I said, okay, I said, when will be your next uh, next uh, lecture at Free South University? Uh, why do you need that? We would like to attend. We just left my my uh, classroom, why do you uh, have to go there? So it's very important. I think one, uh, you know, it, it's again a particular case. We are different from Russia because uh, information really makes difference in Azerbaijan society. This is very good. We are different from Turkmenistan because we have Facebook. We have, uh, let me say, uh, social media. We have, uh, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have made TV at least. Don't speak too so loud about that. Yeah. 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 No. But I mean, I mean, again, of of course, we are now. You know, they had even. Uh, TV show on TV on state TV. How to fight these five ten guys in, on on Facebook? And they had they came out m many ideas and open express that we must have trolls, you know, to fight these guys. But all of these things I think fail, uh, and uh, they can shut up the uh, shut up Facebook. They can make Azerbaijan like Turkmenistan. Uh, I think I don't I don't I don't. Uh, believe that it is possible. So in my case, uh, in, my, in, my, in my view, you know, in Azerbaijan, they, of course they're going to, you know, to fight against it because uh, for them it's unbearable now, you know, any, any single information for them. That, I'm not talking about Azerbaijan. Sometimes I'm making some kind of, you know, news about Turkmenistan, so they don't like it. I mean, I, I, for example, I made a kind of cups, put the uh, 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 Turkmen president felt from his, you know, horse, horse during the, the horse race, yeah. and put his new monument on horse, which he built on uh, in, in Ashgabat. Just, you know, again, I just, I didn't say anything. I just put two uh, pictures. Said that this guy is a winner of the uh, horse race, but he fell in, in, in uh, 
from this horse, but still he was proclaimed the winner of the race. And they, that's why they put this monument for him as a winner. So it's just, you know, they don't bear even information, not about Turkmenistan. When I say something, people call me the friend of North Korea, because I always use the North Korea. They said, why are you talking this about North Korea? Don't talk about North Korea. Talk about other things. But I think still, still will will find, you know, man is a creative man. They will will find, you know, create. Uh, we are creative creatures. We are going to find ways how to deal with the issue. And so that's how, that's why I'm a little bit positive. Hi, uh, my name is Anna. I'm from Poland. And actually in Poland in the 19th, beginning of the 19th century, uh, throughout actually the end of communism in Poland, we had a phenomenon that was called uh, the, the flying universities, uh, or floating universities, sometimes the translation goes. And the idea of these universities was uh, to provide education that was free of censorship uh, to young people, or anyone who just uh, was willing to listen to an alternative uh, uh, well, to censorship-free information and uh, lectures. Uh, in the 19th century, of course, the idea was a little bit different. Poland was under partition, and and uh, they tried to uh, preserve the culture. But under communism, of course, uh, especially in the subject of history, uh, certain truths uh, couldn't be taught, and uh, the flying universities played an amazing role in educating the, the generation of young people. Uh, it stopped in 1989 because uh, after the transition or transformation of the system, there was no need for this kind of activities anymore. I wonder if um, taking this best practices, of course it was not only happening in Poland, in other countries as well. Do you see, especially in Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan, because these are <laughs> the worst uh, currently um, examples, or it's very difficult to um, have free independ uh, independent education. Do you see this um, happening? Uh, do you see this adaptation of this model uh, in your countries, or perhaps it ha it's already happening? If so, uh, to with what effect? Thank you. In my country, no. <laughs> <laughs> Just short answer. I think we have the cases, but I do not like, uh, do not want to elaborate on that a lot because. Uh, but I think we have a kind of. At least I, I know a few examples when these kind of things are happening. I think the government also knows that they are existing and that this kind of you know, experience is existing. But maybe next will be that it will be their target. But I think, you know, the, the problem is maybe I'm too optimistic on it. Uh, maybe I'm too optimistic. But I think, you know, when you have, for example, Stalin had his great terror from 1936-1938. Nobody knows what, what would happen if without the Second World War and how it could continue. I, I, I tell you one story you know, from the Soviet times. I think everybody from the Soviet times remembers it. You know, we had a case. It was uh, mid-1980s mid or maybe uh, early 1980s. We had it on the Soviet team. One guy called American professor from New Mexico, something, uh, Charles Hyde. They were showing us this guy. He was on hunger strike against the uh, against the VMD or WMD or something like this. Uh, he, they were showing us always him on TV all day. This is the first day of his. Uh, hunger strike, second day, third day. I remember on 10th or 15th day, we started collecting money for him. You know, uh, nobody asked each other why, why do his knee, you know, did he, uh, uh, do, did he need the money? But still we collect him. We were in, in solidarity with this guy who were fighting against the imperialism or things like that. And I remember in the 35th and 5th day or 36th and 40th day, I was in, on bus and I saw two guys and they know each other. One and just entered the bus and said, you know, maybe it was a little bit drunk or something, but they said, have you heard news about how there, what, what kind of news? You know, they found a Korsik in this pocket. Korsik was in kind of, 
Yeah. I mean, it was a joke, you know, joking. I and mean, even without, you know, under the Soviet rule, still their people were joking started, you know. So that's why I'm saying that it's almost impossible to completely sh shut down this what's happening, especially now. It's the 21st century, it's all this internet, all this. And I, I, I cannot, you know, everything is possible in this world. But still, I'm still optimistic that, you know, many, many good things are going to happen. Okay, just uh, answer your question. Not, not, not exactly floating universities, but well, uh, among the existing universities in Russia, there are everybody uh, know that there are some more liberal and some notoriously conservative uh, faculties, departments, and universities. And there are uh, well, in my university. I remember a student came to us and said, "You know, my parents told me that you brainwashing us. You know, we brainwashing that you by uh, letting you read." Uh, uh, good uh, book by scholars, and uh, your parents want you to, to watch TV instead, <laughs> instead of that brainwashing. But still, there are some uh, liberal departments, and they continue to, to teach, and I hope that will, will be continued. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, there is a, a little bit less political, but uh, similar development. Uh, there is a lot of uh, bureaucratic pressure in the most of the Soviet. Uh, Sorry, Soviet Russian, of course, the universities now, most of the Russian universities are now under a very heavy uh, bureaucratic pressure. Every professor needs to write, produce like hundreds of pages of junk papers for reporting, for planning, for, you know, uh, and this is actually very, uh, very depressing for, for, for a for professor to, to do this kind of stuff. And this is a demand from the Ministry of Education, from the authorities, and it's uh, and, uh, and on the other hand, I know many professors who are starting to teach outside of the universities, and there is a big demand for that. In the provincial cities, in the well, city where I was born, in Volgograd, in Irkutsk, in Khabarovsk, I know a lot of friends who are doing like public lectures and public continuous uh, efforts in the museums and uh, some public spaces. And it's a lot of people uh, from the society who wants to attend. And this is not always political, or very, maybe less political, more about cultural studies about. But this is a uh, appearance of independent education, and uh, this can have a very interesting future. Uh, I can uh, I can't uh, keep silence because I'm a big fan of uh, Polish educational reform. <laughs> Polish education system. Of course, we learn, uh, we learn experience of, uh, of uh, Poland and uh, try to introduce all the best uh, from you uh, in our system. And uh, about flying university, yes, we have. We have a uh, Belarus Collegium, it's uh, so kind of flying university, and uh, other environment educational, and uh, other new um, uh, education environment on new. Uh, how to say, on new digital platforms uh, in uh, existing in the uh, digital uh, society. But uh, we have uh, not only university, we have underground school. I was a teacher of this uh, school. Uh, um, uh, our lyceum was closed, uh, call, um, authority called us optimized. Uh, yeah, was closed in uh, 2003. Uh, and uh, now it is it, it, it exists. It exists uh, as underground school, underground secondary school. Uh, there is uh, uh, it is not on the paper of Ministry of Education, but but real exist. Uh, teachers, pupils, uh, students, um, uh, but uh, uh, what uh, what I uh, what I. I ah, I want want to, to say that Polish education is uh, for, um, for for us is is good because, is good uh, example because the same mentality, the same uh, cultural background, the same historical background. Um, but uh, we have a myth uh, in the mind of our educators that uh, that the Soviet system is good is rather good. And maybe it was good for. Uh, 20th century, but not for 21st. And uh, um, I uh, thank you for the, for your questions. We uh, we so for example for example. Uh, 
PISA investigation, uh, this uh, pupils assessment. Uh, the Pol Poland have very good fourth, uh, very good level of education, secondary education, maybe a fourth, uh, fourth place in the Europe. But uh, Russia about 2742. Uh, but Belarusian educated uh, official, uh, officials want to uh, translate Russian experience, not Polish experience, and will try to to gain all all from Czech, from Poland, from United States, from uh, uh, Sweden, to bring uh, in Belarusian officials, to introduce in Belarusian officials system, first of, first of all. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, we're about to run out of time. I, 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 there's one thing I wish we could have had more time to talk about, and this is sort of the digital, uh, the effects of the new digital and social environment that we live on, um, again, except for Turkmenistan. Uh, most of these countries, um, people do have access to social media. I would warn, at least from the Russian example, that um, there are also, there's, it's not all positive, right? I mean, there's, um, there's a lot of really bad and ugly stuff that happens um, online and on Twitter and on Facebook. Um, so it's not, it's not always necessarily, um, you know, it's not only freedom-loving people who are, who are using Twitter and, and uh, Facebook these days. Um, so just really quickly, um, we need to wrap it up, but I want to sort of give three takeaways that I have that I have from this from this panel. Um, the first one is that the the educational environment in all four of these countries that we discussed today, they have their differences, but I think we can all agree that um, they can have serious long-term effects on the society that's there. Um, although Altai had had a more uh, positive positive view about um, touch the future, which is which is great. Um, the the second point is that um, exposure to Western points of view in informal education it's important. It's it's good that it's being done, but it's not enough. Um, students need exposure to um, a quality formal education that isn't necessarily. Um, all about the survival of the regime. Um, uh, the third point is that it's not a hopeless, um, even though God was crying in the Turkmenistan example, um, there is some hope. People are getting exposed to, to different points of view. And, um, you know, I, I think it's through the work that you all are doing um, that, that things will, will get better. We hope. So. Um, thank you, thank you so, so very much for participating in this panel. It was a really interesting discussion for me.